welcome to my sewing room. I have such an exciting show for you today, and actually I have two very, very special guests. One will share with you how to put together the quilt that we've been looking at the squares for the whole series, and the other will share with you some really, really nice embroidery stitches. Speaking of embroidery, let me just give you a couple of ideas of the kind of elegant embroidery that I'm talking about that Margaret Boyles will be here to share with you a little bit later. This is a lovely, lovely handkerchief with pin stitch and all kinds of beautiful French knots and satin stitch. You talk about something elegant. Margaret Boyles did that. Here is another Margaret Boyles creation. This is a beautiful, beautiful collar. Isn't it pretty? Do you see the scalloped edge that goes around that collar? And the pin stitch or Madeira applique stitch and the beautiful, beautiful satin stitch. In case you wanted to learn how to do any of those stitches, Margaret will share those with you in just a few minutes. This is another one of Margaret's treasures. This is a napkin with a B. Can you look at the lovely delicate stitches that Margaret does? I'm telling you, I could sew a hundred years and never be able to satin stitch the way Margaret does. Well, maybe someday. I guess I'll have a lesson on the show today. Well, to move on to our very exciting show, which I kind of thought I would call the Margaret and Margaret and Martha show. Now that's the 3M show, isn't it? Anyway, next I have Margaret Boyles, who will be sharing with you the wonderful and very, very neat tricks on how to do satin stitch, French knots, and the feather stitch. Today, I am delighted to have as my guest, Margaret Boyles. I've asked Margaret to come today to teach heirloom embroidery, some very, very special stitches. And by the way, I think Margaret is probably the most renowned needleworker in the United States of America, maybe even the world. Margaret, it is really my pleasure to welcome you to the show today. Well, thank you. I'm so happy to be here and do some stitching with you. Today I thought we'd start out with some really basic stitches that are, that are very important to heirloom embroidery and have chosen satin stitching, feather stitching, and French knots to work on. I've laid out a little basic straight line here to, on which to start the satin stitching. Since it's padded, we have to put some stitches underneath to make it look pretty while we're working. Uh, I pad with a outline of split stitch and then some straight line stitches. I've already done my split stitch on the edges for you and two of the straight line padding stitches. I'm going to put the last one in right down here like this. Now satin stitch is prettiest if it's worked as close as possible and if the stitches are slanted. So I'm bringing my needle to the surface right at the edge of my padding stitch laying my thread across so I get a pretty slant and then going down on the other side just past the padding stitch. And that is a satin stitch, working as close as possible together. A very easy stitch. The, the idea of outlining with the split stitch helps you make your edges much more even, as you can see. It, gives me a good anchoring point on each side. This is the best way to learn. Now what I'm using on this sample piece is a thread called floche, which is fairly heavy, but it is a cotton thread used commonly for embroidery. When I'm working on one of my pieces for a blouse or a dress or a christening gown, I'm working with a small needle, a size 10 cruel needle, and usually a single strand of uh, six strand floss. So this is a little bit heavier than what you will be doing for heirloom embroidery, but this is a good practice thread. Now, I'm going to go move to another hoop, and you can see that I have worked one little flower in satin stitch and a leaf in satin stitch. And hey, Margaret, let me go back and show, let me see that again. One satin stitch. Okay, okay. Now I've outlined this petal of the flower with my split stitch and I'm ready to start working my satin stitch. So I'm going to put two little padding stitches here. 
just big long stitches and incidentally this is often where I begin and end threads because I, you can always use the extra padding. Then I start in the middle of the section and this leaf, I, this petal I think will be prettier if I make my stitches perfectly straight across rather than slanted like on the leaf. Start in the middle where I have a good place to work and just put your stitches real close together. While I'm stitching, I should also mention that I'm working on Irish handkerchief linen, which is the ultimate in luxury for an embroiderer. Because I hope that most of these pieces will be around for another hundred years or so, and I know that the linen will survive that length of time. So you can see how easy that is to do a satin stitch flower. Outline each petal and then fill it in with a satin stitch. Now I'm going to go back to this other hoop and show you a, a French knot, which is what I've done, used for the flower centers. They make pretty little raised stitches. Bring your needle to the surface. I think we can move that out of the way. Then wrap the needle around the th thread once and go down, back down into the fabric two or three threads away. I only ever wrap once. If I want a bigger French knot, I will use a heavier thread. And that is a French knot. Going down two or three threads away is what gives you enough strength so that it won't pull through to the back when you do that final stitch. Now the other thing that we want to work on is feather stitching. This is one of the basic heirloom stitches. We find it everywhere, usually white on white on baby clothes, but I use it on uh, ladies' clothing, anything else that, that uh, I think it will be a pretty little edge on because it's very easy to manipulate. You, see, you can see that I have started this stitch for you. It's a really easy stitch. I pull my thread down t below the needle and just slant my needle into my line, makes a loop, easy little loop stitch. You've noticed that I have my drawings on here in pencil, my favorite tool for putting a, a pattern on the fabric. I starch the, my fabric very lightly and then use a number two or two and a half lead pencil to do the actual tracing. Then when you wash your fabric, the pencil marks are sitting on top of the starch and wash away very easily. Now the one disadvantage of the pencil is that sometimes a little bit of the lead will come off and discolor your thread as you're working. Not a major problem because it washes right off. But I, I prefer it because I can get these nice, nice sharp lines and really get a good accurate tracing. Some of the blue pencils bleed so badly that you really don't know what you're stitching when you go to stitch. You see how easy that is to do? And you can change your size no matter how you how big or how small you want it. I've seen some pieces work really big and I've seen some pieces work really tiny and depending on the piece they're both pretty. Now to do this flower here you've noticed I have a little looks like a vein in that little petal. I have the same thing in this leaf. That's accomplished by doing these in the leaf in two sections and putting your padding stitches so that you have an outline. This also gives me a chance to show you the split stitch. Bring your needle up and go down right through that first stitch you made, right through the center. Actually puncture it from which it gets its name. I've warned all of you that haven't done any embroidery that it's very addicting. 
<laughs> the best thing to do if you haven't done any embroidery is get a book of, of good basic stitches and sit down with the book and a piece of fabric and a needle and thread and just do it. You won't like what you've done in the very beginning. Don't rip it out. Just keep working. Then when you get finished, you'll notice that as you work, it gets better. If you get finished and you absolutely can't stand it, then take it out. But I usually tell students, don't take it out, especially on the first practice pieces, because washing and ironing will help it a great deal. It won't take out your mistakes, but it will make them look a lot prettier. You know, Margaret, that old saying, practice makes perfect, I do believe is. It really is. It's so true with embroidery. And the other thing is, don't worry. If your work doesn't look exactly like your teacher's or the picture in the book, because embroidery is like your signature. Each one of us works it so that it looks a little bit different. You can give 25 students the same thread and the same project, and it will all look just slightly different. Well, Margaret, I just really, really appreciate your being here today. This is just fascinating. Well, thank you. It's been fun. <laughs> now we're going to go to let you see an absolutely magical quilt construction. For those of you that have been with us the whole series, you can now see all of the individual quilt squares all opened up on this magnificent quilt. In a few minutes, Margaret Taylor is going to show you how to put it together, but let me show you one little detail I think is especially nice. The sashing is done in strips of three, a pink and a gold and a uh, turquoise, and then there are quilt, there's the blocks or the squares right here at the corner, corner blocks, and then three strips of sashing rather than one. Now, I'm going to go over to the sewing machine where my dear friend Margaret Taylor is waiting to show you how to put this quilt together. Margaret is const uh, con quilt construction editor of So Beautiful Magazine. Welcome to the show, Margaret. Thank you, Martha. When we first started the series of quilts for the television show, I tried to think of some ways that we could make quilting really interesting. So many people think of quilting as being precise little tiny pieces, so I opted for using larger blocks that we use heirloom adornment on it. And then I decided to use some of the quilting techniques to, sit, to put the quilt together with. As Martha told you, I have three strips of fabric that I've cut together and to determine the width, you determine the width of your sashing and divide that by three and add your seam allowances. And what we're gonna do is we simply fold them together. Now on the machine I'm using today, I have a quarter inch quilting foot. And the beauty of that foot is that it always is one quarter inch distance from the needle to the edge of the foot. And so we're going to sew this strip together and we always have a perfect quarter inch seam every time. And that, with that being the seam allowance, that's what you really need to make sure that everything comes out the same size every time. Let me finish stitching this together. Now to use what I'm stitching it with, my machine needle is just a regular size uh, sewing machine needle. It's an 80 and I have uh, just some good polyester thread on there because quilts have uh, stress put on them. Now we would add the third strip of fabric here and then we'd go to the iron and we would press light to dark, and in this situation, the light to dark would be gold to pink, and that's to keep it from shadowing if you're using a little thinner fabric. When we get the quilt strip, the sashing strip finished, this is what it'll look like, all pressed, and as you can see, I've got the light to dark pressed on the back. Then I would take the sashing strip and cut it to fit my blocks, and then pin it and stitch again using your quarter inch foot. Then I take the strips and I get my exact measurements and I put my center block in place. This is simply to change and add just a little bit of texture and color to the quilt and I'd put it all together. I'd do it either in three short strips or two, some long strips. Then if you notice the border around the outer edge was done in a very different print and I wanted to bring in some color but I didn't want this piece of fabric next to my quilt block because it would have made it too busy. So I used just a strip of black since this has black in it and stitched it to it. 
Then you press your light to darks again, and this is what your border looks like. Now, once you put your, when you go to put your border on, put the black next to your quilt top. And as you can see, the difference that it makes, it, it makes your blocks jump out at you. Once you get this stitched on, then you're ready to layer and do your quilting. Your layering will consist of your quilt top and your batting. And this is a batting that's made for machine quilting and then your backing fabric. And you want your quilt to be fairly taut when you're uh, getting ready to do your machine quilting. And you can either do that, you can do that in a couple of ways. You can put your batting and your backing on a table and let it overlap on the sides and tape it down and pull it. You can put C clamps on it to hold it in place. And what we did was we got it good and tight. Then we put our, these little bitty plastic, they look like what you put tags on clothing with. And what they are, it come, it's a little gun that you can inject in there and it holds them real tight. Now, in order to do machine quilting, you'll have trouble with skip stitches if you use a regular sewing machine needle. And I wanna show you, you may, and you may not be able to see it, this needle here, without the green marking, is a regular sewing machine needle and the one with the green is one called a quilting needle. And the difference between the two is that from the eye to the point of the needle, the, it's longer on your quilting needle than on your regular needle. So that allows you more of the needle going through the fabric for that extra thickness. You also want to increase your machine stitch up to about a three. And then I always start my quilting by folding. You can either fold or roll it in. And if you have a, a foot with a guide on it, you can do that. I slip it under my presser foot and starting in the center, then we do what's called quilt in the ditch. You can do that with a colored thread. And of course, you wouldn't do it with white, but I wanted you to be able to see this. And what I'm doing is following my, rows of, my row of stitching, and you let the machine feed itself through. Now, if you have a walking foot, a walking foot is wonderful because it helps feed the machine through, and I did not drop the one on this one, and I should have. But always use your walking foot, and it's a good idea when you're quilting if you have a foot, a uh, button for needle down, then use that. And as you notice, it's hard to keep your quilting straight. So if you want to not have to worry about that, see how it should, and the white, of course, is gonna show a lot more too. You can use a monofilament. And then you finish off your edges with your bias binding, just like you do any other quilt. Just fold your bias in half and stitch it, and either stitch in the ditch or stitch by hand. And that's how simple it is to do. You notice the corners of the quilt are not stitched down. They're tacked in place with pins or with the little plastic clips. All you do to correct, to hold your miters in place is put it under your presser foot, making that part of your quilting design and stitch right over those miters. And Martha, that is how simple and easy it is to put one of these quilts together. Well, Margaret, you make it seem awfully simple, and I do think that the sampler type quilts are easier to put together than the others. Much easier because the, the piecing on a sampler quilt doesn't have to be quite as precise because you're not dealing with so many small pieces. Well, Margaret, I just love your quilt designs, and thank you so much for being here today. I've absolutely loved having you here. Thank you, And Margaret. I know that all of our viewers have enjoyed it, too. Thank you. Next, I have a really exciting craft for you. I bought this collar at a craft show and I really liked it. Let me just show you what the collar looks like. It's made out of pieces of an antique quilt and has Battenberg around it. But you know, I love Crazy Patch, so I thought, well, I wonder what that collar would look like in Crazy Patch and Silk Dupioni. And sure enough, we've recreated a maybe sort of one of those collars, this time using the fabrics that I love so much. Here is the front and let me turn it over so you can see the back using the ribbons and the crazy patch and the braid and the machine quilting. It's really very easy to do. Let me share with you how. I use this purple silk dupioni as the background piece and I'm going to see, it, see if this Battenberg matches and it does. 
Okay, now since I'm going to Crazy Patch, I really need to use a muslin as a background. So I take the Battenberg uh, placemat here that I'm using, I kind of cut it away, draw off the design, and here is the basis of my Crazy Patch collar. Okay, then I remove my laces and bring all of my Crazy Patch goodies over here. I've used all different colors, oh my goodness, I just love it. And then you start and you sew down one side, and then you come over here and you sew another seam like that and then over. And then I just crazy patch all over this collar using one beautiful color after another. And then of course one of the fun things about crazy patch is to take motifs such as this little Swiss motif which really is petty point. To take tiny little silk ribbon flowers, these have already been preformed, so they're really easy to do. They can be glued or stitched on. And then to take braid, and you know how I love all of the embroidery stitches on all of my sewing machines, and just go absolutely crazy using those beautiful stitches on your sewing machine. Next, I have a beautiful green, just a gorgeous forest green silk dupioni and lace pillow for you. This silk dupioni pillow, I just love. Let me let you take a closer look at it. You see it almost has miter, it has mitered points. It's almost like two squares turned sideways. Then there's another little square of lace that goes in the middle and a little motif. And you know what I really love about it too? I love this tubing that's been just kind of smooshed around here and pinned down. I think that's really pretty. Now that looks like a hard pillow to make, but it is not. First of all, in order to make this square of lace, you simply uh, zigzag together, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pieces of lace to make it as wide as you want to. Then, when you're, go when you're getting ready, let me just unpin this so I can show you the whole thing. When you're getting ready to take the lace around, just as if you were mitering a lace diamond, you put a pin at the top, a pin at the bottom, fold the whole piece of lace back on itself. You can do it with one row of lace or with two and remove the pin that goes through two layers and bring the piece of lace over and look at there. Your miter is in there just perfectly. The same principle happens on this other corner as if it were the bottom of a diamond. And you know we've done some lace shaping diamonds. Let me see if I can straighten it out here. Okay, pin at the top. Now I cannot fold it back on itself. That will not work, will it? So I'm going to fold it underneath just like that and look at there I have a beautiful miter right in place and of course I will have to come in here and zigzag it all down and trim away. Now the inside is made by doing the same thing with that same piece of lace just making a smaller um, figure here it's actually a square turned sideways. Then that will be stitched down on top the little Swiss motif in the middle goes in, and this is really cute here. When you smush this tubing, it's nothing in the world but tubing, and then I bring it like this, and I bring it like this to make that little point, and then smush it in, which I think is a really cute way to finish off the corners. Next, I'd like to invite you to my attic, and let's see what's in my grandmother's trunk. <laughs> Embroidery really is a centuries old art. I want you to see this little turn of the century dress, oh, excuse me, coat. It's absolutely beautiful. All of the embroidery on this little piquet coat is done by hand. The design is so sweet, it's a bow with lilies of the valley kind of peeking out of the bow. As you go around the collar, that beautiful hand scalloped collar with the most beautiful stitches you've ever laid your eyes on, and the embroidery, of course, goes all the way around to the back of this beautiful little heavy white piquet coat that would really be just as pretty for today as it was a long time ago when this little coat was made. I thought you would appreciate just seeing that type of embroidery that Margaret Boyles has just taught you how to do. I certainly enjoy all of the embroidery on all of my antique clothes and just marvel at how someone could have spent so much time embellishing a child's coat. Thank you for joining me on my sewing room. I hope you've had just as much fun as we have, and I'd like to invite you back next time.